Isaiah 45, 22, look to me and be saved all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. And the next verse says this, I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that to me every knee will bow and every tongue will take an oath. And so if you want uh, further proof on the deity of Christ, just realize that God says there is no one else and every knee is going to bow to me and every tongue is going to confess that I am the only God. And yet in Philippians 2, guess who we bow to (laughs) and confess that he alone is Lord, and that is Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at that a little bit in Psalm 2. So if you have your Bible, turn to Psalm chapter 2. We're continuing our series through the book of Psalms. If you've hopefully picked up a study guide, uh, they're still out there. And if you've fallen behind, then that's okay. You can catch up if you need to, or you can just skip the first few chapters. But uh, you could... Follow up the second lesson and do Psalm 2 this week as sort of a follow-up to the sermon, and then you'd be right on target. But I put this together just as a time of encouragement and refreshment. Um, I have felt stress, and I think as I watch what's going on in the world, it's easy to feel overwhelmed and fearful and stressed. And for me, I just knew I needed to just pray sort of the prayer of Psalm 23, that he's going to restore my soul and lead me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. And so hopefully as we go through the Psalms, it can encourage our heart. And hopefully you could do the study guide and just spend time just meditating on God's word and letting him renew your mind through his word and just uh, calm your emotions and lead you beside the still waters and restore your soul. So hopefully um, as we do this together as a body, it can encourage us individually and corporately. But today we're going to look at what I call the submitted life. Last week we looked at the blessed life. This week we're going to look at the submitted life. And both of them are tied together. Uh, The blessed life is the submitted life. And the submitted life does lead to the blessed life. And both of them are tied to the first two Psalms, Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. As we've looked at the introduction to the Psalms, what's the first word that confronts us in Psalm 1? Blessed. It's a word that means it could be translated happiness or oh the blessednesses of the abundant uh, goodness of this kind of life. And so the Psalms immediately invite us into what I would call God's joy. It's calling us to enter into the joy of our Lord, and they're inviting us into this joy. But there's two gates that almost that you have to pass in order to experience God's joy, in order to experience what I would call the shalom, the alignment of being in right relationship to him and right relationship with others and having peace in your heart. To enter into that kind of good life, there's two gates. Psalm 1 tells us you have to go through the gate of God's word. Uh, You have to reject the counsel of the world, and you have to be one who is renewing your mind constantly, daily, delighting in God's word, meditating day and night, and renewing your mind in God's word. Otherwise, you're going to be held captive and drawn away with the counsel of the world, which will always lead to bondage and destruction. But there's another gate, and Psalm 2 gives us the second gate, which is God's Son. God's Word and God's Son, those are the twin gates that invite us into God's joy. And you cannot experience God's joy unless you're willing to be submitted to God's Word, submitted to God's Son. God's written Word, God's living Word, both of them become the gates to the Psalms. I like what Spurgeon said in your outline. The two psalms are worthy of the very deepest attention. They are, in fact, the preface to the entire book of Psalms, and whereby some of the ancients joined into one. The first shows us the character and the lot of the righteous, and the next teaches us that the psalms are messianic and speak of Christ the Messiah, the prince who shall reign from the river unto the ends of the earth. And so those two psalms become our introduction. Now, as we go into the book of Psalms, now again, we're going to develop this a little bit more as we go through this series But there's five books. The the Psalms are divided up into five books, and the five books seem to replicate, in some sense, the Pentateuch, the early five books of the Old Testament, but they also seem to give us an overview of the redemptive message. The first 41 Psalms are all written by David, and they uh, highlight the conflict. In those Psalms, David's always talking about his enemies, his enemies, his enemies, and his enemies. And yes, they were physical enemies, but I think what you have is a picture of the conflict of the ages, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And when David, the, the messianic, the type of the Messiah, is speaking of his enemies, it tells us about a bigger conflict and a bigger enemy that is out there, a spiritual conflict that we're all born into. You realize you were born into a spiritual war. <laughs> Um, We live in the theater of the cosmos, part of a story bigger than us, stretching from eternity to eternity into the midst of a heavenly conflict that has waged since the day Satan declared his independence from God and deceived mankind 
and to joining his rebellion. This is the reality in which we are born, and this is the perspective that gives us understanding and wisdom and how to live. And so this conflict is what we're born into, and that, those first psalms seem to highlight that. Then you go to Psalm 42 to 72, and even though we live in a world that is against us, we're not called to see, uh, we're wrestling against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the high places. We need to understand that even though we live in this spiritual conflict, we're called to communicate to the nations and invite them to worship God. We're not to see people as enemies. We're to see them as those that we are inviting into the worship of God. And that's what you see in these Psalms, 42 to 72, where there's constantly, oh, nations, join in worshiping this God who's created us. Psalm 73 through 89 have all the laments, or almost um, chock full of laments. And it reminds us as we go through this life, guess what? We're going to go through some difficult times. There's going to be devastation. There's going to be despair. There's going to be exile. And so as we're in this spiritual battle and we're communicating to the nations, we understand that we are going through some difficult times where it's going to feel like life is out of control. But Psalms 90 through 106 tell us the way you get through that is faith in God's sovereignty, faith in God's kingship. And throughout those Psalms, you hear this refrain, our Lord reigns, Yahweh Malak. He is king. He is the one who reigns. So how do you get through this devastation and despair? You keep your eyes focused on the sovereignty of God. Then Psalms 107 through 150, consummation and celebration. This is where the word hallelujah comes into play. Uh, We think of hallelujah, and you you assume hallelujah is all through the scriptures, right? You know where hallelujah is found exclusively? The last part of Psalms and Revelation 19. That's the only two places it's found. The consummation of the story. You shout hallelujah when God finally reigns and sets this world right. And so I just want you to get that in your mind. We're going to go over it again. But just see that there's a flow here in the whole, uh, the way the Psalms are arranged. That's not just arbitrary, but it's pointing to this redemptive story. So let's look at Psalm 2. And uh, since it's, it was a song and we should sing it, we're going to sing it together. Are you ready? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it wouldn't sound, it wouldn't be very good. Anyway, I do want us to read it together because it reminds us that these were to be communal songs. I mean, yes, they're sung individually, but this was what you would be singing in the congregation. So we're not, I'm going to have you read uh, verses 1 through 3. I'm going to read 4 through 9 and then have you join me again on 10 through 12. And we'll read through this psalm together. Um, as sort of a corporate way of uh, highlighting the psalm. So let's read these first three verses together. You ready? Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Then it goes on and says this, He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. And let's read the application together. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him, uh, or take refuge in him. Remember, Psalm 1 begins with a blessing. How does Psalm 2 end? A blessing. And there's a bookend. And again, it's proclaiming God's word, God's son. Uh, Submitting to God's word, submitting to God's son is the entryway into God's joy. Uh, Twelve verses, four stanzas, three lines each. Each one has sort of a different speaker. And each message is uh, proclaiming to us the value or the sovereignty of God and man's response to that. So let's look at man's initial response. I call this the angry rebellion of the nations. He says, why do the nations rage? And that word rage in Hebrew, ragash, means any noisy or riotous assembly that practically seethes in its antagonism. Have you ever seen a crowd of people gather and they're just seething with anger? (laughs) Uh, 
Some people said we lived in an age, we live in an age of protest where it's just everywhere you see it seems like people are assembling. Social media is drawing more and more people together. And so many times those protests are just seething with anger. Sometimes they're not even sure why they're there. They just know they're angry about something and they need, want to demand that something be changed, something be bended more towards their will. And the question is asked right at the beginning, why are the nations so angry? Why? Why is there this tumult among the nations? And then why do they uh, imagine or plot a vain thing? That word plot is the same word for meditate in chapter or Psalm 1. So instead of meditating on God's word and constantly allowing God's word to change them, they're constantly man- meditating on vanity, futility, things that don't matter, and things that just make them angrier and angrier, and they never stop to ask why. Why am I so angry, and where is this leading? Does it have any eternal value? Or I'm just angry and upset about life, and I'm just going to gather and constantly just rehearse in my mind things that do not lead anywhere of value. But that's the question that's asked. And who are they against? What is it against? Ultimately, it uh, can be against a, a lot of different things, but ultimately at the root of that tumult and that anger, it's against the Lord and against his anointed. Ultimately, it's a a denial of God and his authority over us, a denial of the accountability that we have towards God. But notice it's against the Lord and against his Mashiach, against his Messiah. And those two are joined together. To reject one is to reject the other. To reject the Messiah is to reject the Lord, Yahweh. To reject Yahweh is to show itself in rejecting the anointed because those two are so intertwined that to reject one is to reject the other. To accept one is to accept the other, which is exactly what Jesus is going to say in John 8. You've rejected me. You've also rejected God. And then what's their goal? What are they looking for? What's this all this rage and futility about? They're looking for what I would call maybe that word freedom, but I think it's a little bit more than freedom. I think freedom is the right to do or the responsibility to do what you ought and just having the ability to do that. But most people in today's culture would define freedom as to do whatever I want whenever I want. And notice what they're angry about, what they want. Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. They see God and his authority as sort of a bondage, and they just want to break that bondage. They want to break his authority, any accountability to him, and cast it aside. Because really, I don't think they're looking for freedom. I think they're looking more for what I would call radical autonomy. That word autonomy, um, nomos means law, atos means self. Radical self-rule. I am my own law. I can construct my own identity and my own reality. What our culture wants, what the world wants ultimately is to deny God so I can do whatever I want and I'm a law to myself. I don't want to be accountable to anyone. On a humorous plane, I can remember when my boys were young and I've probably used this illustration before, but we're, Liz and I were going off on our conference. We were going to be gone for a week. And uh, so we told the boys we're going to be leaving uh, next week and going away for, for a while. And the first question was, well, who's going to come and watch us? Who's going to take care of us? And jokingly, I sort of said, oh, nobody. Uh, Nate's going to be in charge. And Nate was probably eight or nine years old at the time. I said, oh, Nate's going to be in charge. And to my surprise, they all started cheering. <laughs> They thought that was a wonderful arrangement. And I think it was my son Noah. I I don't want to put it all on you, Noah. But I think Noah said, oh, Nate, we can eat whatever we want, and we can stay up all night and play video games. And in their mind, it was like, it hit me at that point. And I think he was somewhat kidding. I hope he was. I'm not sure. But in their minds, they looked at us like Liz and I as somehow this killer of joy that's in the house and the, the, the hinderers to, to their just joyous irresponsibility in life. And we're just sort of the ones that are blocking just them experiencing just the joys of freedom. And as I thought about that, that's sort of, you think about that, the kids think somehow that if the parents leave and they can have the house to themselves, life's going to be wonderful. Of course, I'm thinking, who's going to get your food? And who's going to cook your food? Uh, and do you realize you have to pay for electricity? And, and this is my house, you know. I can kick you out if I want to. And, I mean, you just realize, and if you stay up all night and eat whatever you want and stay all, all night and eat, I mean, play video games, yeah, it might be fun to begin with, but you realize you're destroying your life. I mean, 
Uh, what looks like fun ultimately is going to lead to a life that means absolutely nothing and is futile in its uh, accomplishment. But that's sort of the world we live in. And I think, why do people reject God? Well, some people say, well, because they came to a rational conclusion. I don't buy it. You know why people reject God? Because they don't want to be accountable to him. Uh, Aldous Huxley, in his book, Ends and Means, was pretty honest when he said, I had motives for not wanting the world to have a meaning and consequently assumed that it had none and was able without any difficulty to find satisfying reasons for this assumption. For myself, as no doubt for most of my friends, the philosophy of meaninglessness was essentially an instrument of liberation from a certain system of morality. We objected to the morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom. Fyodor Dostoevsky, uh, his book Brothers Kar Karamazov, said, if God does not exist, everything is permitted. Dr. Kate Bowler, uh, an author, a Christian history professor at Duke University who's actually dying of stage four cancer, uh, said this, control is a drug and we are all hooked. Basically, we want the world to bend to our will, and we even want God to bend to our will, and if he won't bend to our will, well, they'll just deny his existence and pretend he does not exist or reinvent him to a God that does cater to our wants and desires. Um, at our house, we got new service you know, every once in a while, well, I'll tell you exactly what I do. Every two years, I switch my Internet and TV because I get promotional pricing for two years. As soon as that promotional pricing is done, I call to see if they'll extend it. If they won't, I switch to the other company and get their two-year promotional pricing. That's just how cheap I am. But anyway, <laughs> so I just recently switched, and when the people came in to install our new service, they gave me this new remote. I mean, it's very ergon ergonomic. I mean, it fits in my hand so perfectly. I feel like I should control things now. But the coolest thing is after they installed it, the, the guy that came to install it just, just wanted to show me this little button that you press, and as soon as you press it, you speak into it, and the TV does whatever you want it to do. <laughs> and sure enough, I played around with that for a while. That's pretty cool. I, you know, LSU baseball. And sure enough, it brings up LSU baseball. Uh, change the settings, and it would change the settings. I thought, man, that is so cool. Remember the days when you had to change the TV by yourself? I mean, <laughs> and you had the two knobs that you had to get in. And you had a little thing that you had to sort of maybe sometimes tune a little bit. Now, not only can you control your TV with a little button, but now you can just speak. And everything just obeys your voice. And you notice how many things are done by voice command now? Cars, Alexa, uh, Hey Google, whatever, all of those things. And think about the head trip that gives us. Because in our minds, we think we should speak and everything should just happen according to what our voice says. Almost sounds like Genesis 1. <laughs> we want to be our own gods, and we want to be able to speak, and the world just line up and do exactly what we want. And hey, this is a wonderful convenience. I like using it. But don't think that it doesn't start to change the way I expect life to behave and the way I expect people to behave. I speak, and people are supposed to get in line. I speak and this world is supposed to line up with my desires. And if it doesn't, I'm going to be angry because this is the way the life is supposed to be. How does God respond to this angry rebellion of the nations? Well, you hear the, the sovereign response of God, and how does he respond? He laughs. <laughs> you think, wait a second, I'm not sure I like that, that God laughs. He sits in the heavens, shall laugh. Uh, Leupold says in a bold figure the Lord is represented as being amused at the foolish endeavors of his enemies because he sees the futility. Here we are, we're animated dust balls, really. Specks on a speck of an earth that is in a universe we can't even wrap our minds around. We live a sliver of time on this earth, and yet we shake our fist at God and say, I'm the master of my own fate. Who are we? I, I picture this as the best way I can illustrate it, that one day I'm walking out my door, and as I go to the threshold, I notice a small ant sort of crawling on the threshold of my door. And, you know, I don't want to step on him, so I sort of move to the side to sort of walk around him. And I notice that ant just books it across my threshold to get right in front of my foot. I think, that's strange. And so I step over here, and that ant turns around and starts booking it the other side to get right in front of my foot. And I look down at that ant, and that ant, I notice, is standing on its back two legs. And I think, what in the world is that ant doing? And I look, and he's got his front legs like, up like this. And I think, I can't believe I'm seeing what I'm seeing. There's an ant. And so I get as low as I can, and I hear noises coming. 
And as the best as I can interpret ant, ant language, he's telling me that he likes my house and he wants me to get out of his house because he's taken over. What would be your first response to an ant like that? So y'all would step on them, okay. My first response would be to chuckle. <laughs> Who are you? And where did you come from? You need to go back to your people because this is stupid. Um, and so there'd be a chuckling because you realize how futile it is and how dumb it is. And there's also just this sense that, yeah, the next thing you'd probably want to be do is just step on him and move on. And that's sort of what God is sort of saying. Do you realize the futility? That's why there's a verse that's uh, mentioned in Proverbs 3 that's repeated throughout all Scripture. It's changed a little bit or interpreted a little bit. But he mocks those who mock. Notice in chapter 1 there was the scoffers and the scornful. Who are there scoffing and scornful against God and his authority? And God mocks those who mock, but he gives grace to the humble. Or as it's interpreted in the New Testament, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. If you want to latch on to one truth, that is going to be mentioned throughout all of Scripture. It's this one. God resists the proud, but he gives grace, abundant grace, to the humble, to those of broken and contrite spirit. And I think what makes even the ant illustration not appropriate is the fact that God himself, in him we live and move and have our very being. My very breath and heartbeat is dependent on God. Uh, Job, if he should set his heart on it, if he should gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together and man would return to the dust. We think we're in control. You're not even in control of your heartbeat right now. <laughs> One heartbeat, you're in the presence of your creator. Do you realize that? He could, he could withdraw his breath at any moment. He sustains the universe right now, and we're not in control of it. If we were to all line up against this wall and be convinced that if we pushed hard enough, we could stop the rotation of this earth, would that be foolishness? And yet somehow we think we're in control? And we're masters of our own fate. Yes, God laughs at the futility of it. And then he speaks in his wrath because he's speaking against the pride of man that just rises up against us and doesn't even think rationally. And then he says these words, Yet I have set my king on my holy hill. That's in the perfect tense, meaning it's already done. <laughs> you can fight it all you want. But God's Messiah is going to rule from Zion, from Jerusalem. And it's so clear, and it's already done in the sovereignty of God because he's the Alpha and Omega. It's a done deal. Jesus Christ is going to reign from Jerusalem. And you can fight it all you want, but that's what's going to happen. And God's already declared it. And anything opposed to that is operating in futility. If you wanted to back up a little bit, I've gone through this as we did the drama of Scripture, but when God created the heavens and the earth, when he created the earth, he put earth under the stewardship, under the dominion of man, Adam and Eve. But when Adam and Eve decided to rebel and follow the deception of Satan, in that sense, the kingdom of God was separated. Satan became the god of this world. I still want to emphasize it's totally under the sovereignty of God, but God has allowed it to happen. We live in a world that is in rebellion against God. But God has declared how this story is going to end. And he's basically said that there's going to be a king who's going to arrive. There's going to be a Messiah. And what's so awesome about God's plan is, even though he could have just destroyed earth, he could have stepped on the ant, so to speak, he decided to join his kingdom to humanity in some way. He decided to join his heavenly sovereignty to an earthly king and to join his heavenly throne to an earthly city. And so what you have is God declaring that there's going to be a king, a human king that's going to rule on this earth, just as he said is going to happen uh, in Genesis 1 and 2. And he's going to rule from a certain place. He's going to re rule from Zion, from Jerusalem. You realize you can get in a plane right now and fly to Jerusalem. It's a city that's here on this earth. And Jesus Christ is going to reign there, <laughs> that place. What God has done is he's joined humanity and his very nature in the person of Christ. And what he's doing, uh, done is joined his purpose uh, to the purposes of earth. And he's joined his heavenly throne, uh, his sovereignty to a earthly city that he is going to reign from. A city that you can visit today that is going to be the place where Jesus Christ is going to reign. And so his kingship is joined to his chosen king. His throne is joined to his chosen city. Well, who is this man? I've sort of already given you the hints. 
But what Psalm 2 is going to give us is this unique relationship of the Messiah. Who is this Messiah? Look at verse 7. Now the Messiah is going to speak, this son of David, and he says, I'm going to declare the decree that's already been given. The Lord has said to me, who's the me? This is the anointed one speaking. You are my son. Today I've begotten you. Ask of me. I'll give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. All of this is tied to the Davidic covenant. The Davidic covenant is the key covenant that you're going to see uh, throughout the Psalms because they're mostly written by David who that covenant was given to. And they're always looking for a son of David. Uh, what is the Davidic covenant? You find it in 2 Samuel 7. The Lord declares to you that he will make you a house when your days are fulfilled, speaking to David, and you rest with your fathers. I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Uh, Psalms is going to emphasize that. Psalm 89. Remember, again, if you think through the flow of Psalms, Psalm 89 is at the end of the laments where we're seeing the devastation and the despair that God's people are going to go through. And at the very end, before you move to this faith in God's sovereignty, you have this statement. My covenant I will not break nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever. His throne is the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky. Just always remember that a covenant is God's promise surrounded by his oath. And you can have no more two immutable things than God giving a promise and then saying, just so you understand how key this promise is, I'm going to surround it, I'm going to swear in my holiness. And he puts an oath around it saying, this is something you can count on. That famous verse that we like in Isaiah 9, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And what is that rooted in? It's rooted in the Davidic covenant. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. What that means is God is passionately moving all of history. He is working all things according to the counsel of his will, and it's all headed to the place where Jesus Christ reigns on this earth. And if you can fight against that or you can acknowledge that and align your life with the purposes of God, and that's what Psalms is encouraging us to do, God's word and God's son or the entrance into that alignment that brings God's joy. There's also that statement uh, uh, where he says, today, or you are my son, today I have begotten you. That has created some theological discussions because people think, wait a second, was he declared son then or was he always the son? He was always the son in the eternity um, and all throughout eternity. But what does the New Testament does? It interprets it for us. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus. And it's also written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Uh, Romans 1 is going to put it this way. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which was promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who is descended from David, so he's a son of David according to the flesh, and was declared, publicly declared, to be the son of God. How? How? In power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so what I think Psalm 2 is referring to is, yes, uh, the son has always been the son. He's the son of David. But how would we know? Well, when he conquered death, it was declared to all people that he is the son of God. And think about it. For the Davidic covenant to have fulfillment, there has to be a son of David who is able to rule forever. How can a human descendant of David rule forever? Well, he has to be one who can conquer death. He has to be one that has shows the power that he has power over sin and power over death. So what the resurrection has done is it has publicly declared that this son of David is also the son of God. And he is capable of ruling forever and ever because he has power over death. I've said it many times. Uh, don't make a difference what you think about religion, what you think about reality. If Jesus Christ rose from the dead historically and bodily, it changes everything. Because now we have been told and been, it's been declared that he is the son of God. He is Lord. And now the only response that matters is what is my response to this son of David, this son of God who is going to reign forever and has control and power over death. 
as the Bible says, therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those in heaven, of those on earth, and those under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so that was this urgent appeal to the nations. And he gives this urgent appeal in 10 through 12, and he's saying this is, this is reality. <laughs> this is the way things are moving. So what's the response? First of all, be wise and teachable. Don't think you know everything. <laughs> Stop and realize the futility of trying to oppose uh, the will of God. And just be wise and be teachable, recognizing that my heart needs to be receptive to the word of God because it is the truth. It survived long before me. It will survive long after me. And it is the truth, and I need to submit to it and be wise and teachable. Then he says, fear the Lord and rejoice with trembling. Uh, fear the Lord. Recognize his power. Recognize his sovereignty. But you do it with joy. And sometimes we think, how do those two mix together, this fear and joy or this respect and joy? And today I was praying with Daniel Newton and Dan, and Daniel Newton just gave me a great illustration. He says, it reminds me of my dog. <laughs> when my dog uh, sees me and sort of goes back on his back and sort of just yields himself. And it's sort of a combination of respect. He recognizes that uh, I'm in control, but there's a little bit of a joy there because his tail's usually wagging because he knows when he yields himself to me, he knows I'm going to pick him up and hold him in my arms or I'm going to rub his belly. And it's that sort of that submission to God, recognizing that he's also a God who loves me and is going to take me into his arms. That's why he says, kiss the son or submit to the son. And that picture of kissing the son really is a picture of submission because the picture seems to be that you are bowing before him and you're kissing his feet, which is what you would do to a sovereign. You would kiss his feet. And so what he's doing is recognizing that God is going to God's Messiah is going to reign, and the only proper wise response is to bow at his feet and to kiss his feet in acknowledgement that he is Lord. But what's so awesome is when you kiss his feet, you notice that there's wounds, and there's nail prints there. And as you look up in his face and he reaches down with his hand to pick you up, you recognize that his hands also bear the wounds. And as he pulls you up and embraces you, because I love that quote, when it says, if you lay yourself at Christ's feet, he will take you up into his arms. Because you realize the one who is Lord, the one that you're bowing before, is also your Savior. The one who gave his life for you and for me. And so that's why the last statement is, blessed are all those who take refuge in him. He has all power. He's the one who's going to reign, but he's the one who loves you and invites you to take refuge in him. And blessed is any person who recognizes their dire situation, recognizes they have no solution for sin, no solution for death, and they yield before the Son. And in yielding before the Son, they recognize that he's not only Lord, but he is Savior who died on the cross for their sins. If you've never taken refuge in him, I invite you to do that. Um, you have no other solution for the wrath of God. You have no solution for death. You have no solution for sin. It's all going to be found in submission to your Savior, Jesus Christ, which is a perfect tie-in to communion because communion reminds us that this Lord of all has given his life and has invited us into communion both with the Father and with the Son and with each other. And so if you've never trusted in Christ, I pray you won't leave here today without acknowledging the fact that you need a Savior and acknowledging the fact that Jesus Christ is the only name under heaven by which we can be saved and that you would confess him and declare him as your Savior and Lord this morning. And for us as believers, as I thought through an application, I was just reminded of the fact that it is truly the submitted life that leads to the blessed life. My, my servers can go ahead and come forward if they want to. Um, as I thought about this message, I was reminded of when I was in New Jersey. Um, I was in New Jersey as a pastor from 98 to 2010. I was associate pastor up there. I can remember when I went, first went to New Jersey. Uh, Y'all can ahead and have a seat because I'm going I'm to keep talking. <laughs> I can remember when I went to New Jersey, I had this picture in my mind that New Jersey was going to be a temporary stop, that God was, you know, it was going to be a great adventure. It was going to be good to be part of an associate pastor, learn about the Northeast. But in my mind, I can honestly say I had a picture in my mind that was going to last about three or four years. Um, I don't think I ever wrote that down, but just in my mind, I just felt like God was preparing me to be a pastor somewhere 
And this would be a good training time. As I got up there, and year after year went by, and there were several opportunities that came up where churches were looking at me, considering me as pastor, and it always came down to like two people, and they always chose the other person. And when the third time it happened, I'd been up in New Jersey for about 10 or 11 years. I'd just turned 40, and I'm just at this point where I'm thinking, I'm not sure I, I know what God's doing. Um, I had this plan in my mind. I thought God was on board with my plan, and, and he's not been on board with it. And so I'm sort of just confused. And I can remember going on a retreat because when that third denial happened, I can remember just, just sinking and realizing, um, I'm not sure what God's preparing me for. I went on this retreat. It was a week-long retreat, and uh, I just went off by myself. It was a, a place there that would just allow pastors to do. And I can remember just praying and just trying to seek God's wisdom. Should I be looking for another church? Should I, what should I do? And I finally came to the conclusion that God was telling me, you know what, you just need to learn to serve me where I have placed you and find your joy in me and not worry about the future. And he finally told me in, in my mind, you need to get to a point where you can say, if God, if you have me serve in New Jersey the rest of my life, I am totally good with that. And so I can remember getting to a place where I just sort of with my hands up, finally just said, God, if you want me to stay in New Jersey and continue to serve here as associate pastor, as long as that, you know, that ministry lasts, I will stay as long as you want me to stay. And I sort of gave up this picture because I think all of us have these pictures of how life's supposed to turn out, don't we? You got them. You have a picture in your mind. It's almost a photo book of how life should look, how your family should look, how everything, your health should look. You have that picture book in your mind. And whenever life does not meet that picture book, you get very upset. And what God is calling us to is to recognize that it's the submitted life that leads to the blessed life. When I prayed that prayer, I had no idea that a week later, Larry Miller would call me on the phone and invite me to be pastor at Community Bible Church. Do you realize that third refusal was because that church chose Bill Young as their pastor instead of me? And so as he went to that church, which was the fit God had for him, he opened the door. So what looked like a closed door was God opening this door, which to me has been God's blessing in my life and in my family's life. And I don't say that to say as soon as you submit, God's going to give you what you want. That's not the point. Because as I interviewed for this job, there was a totally different attitude because I realized, you know what, if it doesn't happen... I'm good. I've already submitted this to God. So whether I stay in New Jersey or whether God leads me to Louisiana, I'm good either way because I've already offered this up to God and said, God, whatever you want, that's what I want. And when you delight yourself in the Lord, he gives you the desires of your heart. 